look to the Right Honourable Lord Kenneth Baker, Magdalen College, to continue the case first, for the proposition. First, would I congratulate Henry and Kansu for making very eloquent speeches, um, and thank you, Mr. President, for inviting me to come back. I haven't been here for some decades. It's been a long time between drinks, but I couldn't resist your invitation to come and speak in this particular week, because this is the political week of the year. It could be the political week of the decade. It could even be the political week of the century. Exciting time for the union to be uh, voting, uh, debating this subject.、Uh, the political world, when I was here 65 years ago, was very different from today. Then, politics was dominated by two big parties. The Conservative membership peaked out at 3.3 million, the, La the Labour at 1.1 million, and between them, they shared government for 150 years, and they provided the essential thing for successful democracy: <coughs> majority governments. They were the gatekeepers of democracy. Now, in the next general election, which I hear from the paper tonight, it's likely to be December the 12th. There'll be five contenders in Britain. There'll be the Conservatives, roughly about 30 percent. There'll be Labour and Liberal at about 25 percent. There'll be Farage at 10 percent and Green at 10 percent. So there's no obvious gatekeeper, and、uh, to see a majority government、uh, re、result from that is a complete lottery. But does this mean the death of democracy? And the pessimists, on the whole, believe that it is going to lead to the death of democracy. We are the optimists who believe that it will not lead to the death of democracy. And in all analyses of the books on, on democracy at the moment, it always starts with the two large parties not providing a majority government. The next stage is they attack the press, as Trump has done in America. He calls CNN traitors and the enemy. But is this going to happen over here? The one thing you've got to realise about Boris, well, there's lots of things you've got to realise about Boris. But one of the essential things is he's a journalist, a journalist with groping tendencies, but a journalist. And Boris is not going to ring up the editors of the big press complaining about how they treat him. Boris is not going to engage young men to go out and break the fingers of the caricaturists and cartoonists who depict him every day. So I don't believe for a moment that the freedom of the press is at all affected in Britain. Point of information. Sorry. Point of information. What? Point of information. Yeah. Where Where are you speaking from? Speak up. Was Boris not recorded on a telephone making a threat to、uh, to get a journalist attacked and beaten up? So I say it again. Was Boris Johnson not secretly recorded threatening to get a journalist attacked and beaten up? Well, no. On the, on the, whatever he's been reported for saying, I can tell you, Boris is not going to attack the press in any way whatsoever. <laughs> he is a journalist. He's going to take them on and shout back loudly.、Uh, then the third argument is that、uh, in this situation, the death of democracy, the rule of law is completely abandoned. It's happened in Poland. The government in Poland appoints judges. But this isn't going to happen in this country. Look what the Supreme Court did to the government only four weeks ago. They actually challenged a political situation. So the ingredients of this slippery slope are not there. The fourth ingredient is populism,、uh, and、uh, populism, in fact, gives power to the powerless. But we've had our moment of populism in the referendum of 2016, and then a large number of people in the north of England and in central England, in fact. Uh, voted to leave because they felt that over the years they'd been ignored, they'd been uh, uh, diminished, they did not believe they had an influence on the development of their societies, and the political elite had not really served them well. And it was an extraordinary and un an unusual result. But that was populism in Britain, and it is yet still to be resolved. And I think lots of politicians and the pessimists believe populism is a great force. The thing to realise most about populism, it is not an international movement that has agreed objectives like communism had. It is in fact a series of particular problems in particular countries that have to be resolved. The particular problem in America on populism was blue collar and the Rust Belt. The particular problem in Turkey was conservative Muslims worried about the、uh, secular state that the Turks had created. In Italy. The, the issue there was anti-Brussels and anti-Euro, and you can't blame the Italians for being anti-Euro because since they adopted, Italy has not had one year of economic growth. No wonder Italy is almost governless today.、Uh, in Brazil, it was homophobic, and it was also exploiting the American jungles. In Britain, the populism was all about Europe and and exit, and this is what we have to try to resolve. 
Now, the Europe for the Tory party has been a poison pill. It has destroyed four Conservative Prime Ministers, Thatcher, Major, Cameron and May, and it might well destroy the fifth. But when I was a younger politician, way back in the 70s, I was a member of Parliament in 72, and I voted for uh, the European Act in 72. I voted in the referendum in 75 to retain in the common market. But the issue then was all about trade. The big arguments of what was going to happen to Australian lamb and New Zealand butter and sugar from the colonies. The only two speakers at that time, the two most eloquent speakers of my generation were Michael Foote and Enoch Powell, and they were the only ones who talked about the loss of sovereignty, which was inevitable if you join an association like the common market, which has now become the European Union. They realized that that was going to be the real problem. And when we were in the European Union, we were never really at the heart of it, was what John Major hoped to be. We were always semi-detached. And we rather reflected what de Gaulle thought about us back in 1963 when he said no to the Macmillan thing. He, uh, he had a great respect for Britain and the government of Britain and for Churchill and all the rest of it. But he never believed that Britain would fit in to an association of, 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 of countries that were continental. Because in our history, we've been much more involved in the broad high seas across the world and not the narrow waterways of Europe. And so we were never really a full member of the European community. And certainly, I fell out of love with them when I became a cabinet, in the, uh, cabinet minister in the Thatcher years as Education Secretary and Environment Secretary and Home Secretary. I would go to meetings in Europe, meeting my fellow associate members. And they were meant to be the check upon the Commission. They, were, they, they met every two months, and they were meant to be the handbrake on the Commission. But the Commission is the overwhelming bureaucratic center of the European Union. There's no doubt about that. And Parliament doesn't, accru uh, doesn't actually uh, control it either. And uh, the various ministers I met, on the first meeting, you get to meet them, just remember their names, second meeting, try to remember them. Third meeting, half had gone because they'd been sacked or promoted, or in, in our case, one had been arrested. And the actual ministers always lectured me on being a good European, but they were a very motley crew. The Italian Minister for Justice went to jail for an enormous fraud in Naples. The Irish Minister of <coughs> Justice uh, had to leave politics because he'd fiddled his election expenses. The Spanish Minister of Justice got the booby prize. He went to jail for murder. And so I did not feel that this was an effective way of controlling this huge, huge machine as so I'd become a constitutional Brexiteer. And so how are we to get out of this particular crisis that we have at the moment? Firstly, the crisis is a conflict between plebiscitary sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty. And on our side of the House, we believe in parliamentary sovereignty and not plebiscitary <coughs> sovereignty. Plebiscites are spectacles carefully stage managed by political elite who decide the question and manipulate the meaning of the result. They are not ways of bringing the country together, they are more divisive. So I am strongly against a second referendum. Many of you may be in favor of a second referendum. You may see it as a way to actually remaining. But if, in fact, you were to have a second referendum and remain was to win, I don't believe that would settle anything at all of our political crises. Because all those 17 million people who voted for leave in 2016 would feel they'd been cheated once again, they'd been thwarted, they were overlooked, they'd been relegated by the clever political elite of the South East. So I don't believe that Remain can produce political agreement and sanity in Britain. I really do believe that. I think the only way that in fact you will get that is for Brexit to happen and for us to leave the European Union. The Extraordinary thing, I think, about the, the, the Remain campaign in Britain is how passionless it is. The passion is all on the side of the Brexiteers. The argument of the Remain, oh, uh, ask not for bell, whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Um, <laughs> uh, I've only really got started. Well, then, uh, I'll try and conclude as briefly as I can. What I have to say to you is that I don't believe they are really fighting very hard for it. I think Europe is about to go into a great deal of trouble. The nationalist pressures in Hungary, Slovakia and Poland are going to overwhelm Europe. Germany now, it's extraordinary, has the largest opposition party of fascists, 
Spain has four elections in four years. Italy is virtually ungovernable. The government is going to collapse. Renzi has left it. Not a very attractive body indeed to actually be a member of, to begin with, apart from anything else. But in fact, I think this debate is not really about who votes tonight and which way you're going. This vote is about what you're going to do to try and to, to, to actually make Britain recover politically. And I believe the only way to do that is to strengthen the two major parties. I know of no other agents who can actually govern and effectively run our country. And so uh, I believe that the caps of socialism and capitalism no longer fit. Socialism is about the politics of the 40s and 50s. Capitalism is about the politics of the 80s and 90s. We have to think of the future. And as a Conservative, I recognise that my party has got to reform fundamentally. You've got to recognise that capitalism has not actually spread capital down to the people at all. It's bitterly offensive that some CEOs can earn 230 times the average salary of their, their workers. If you're going to build millions of homes, the Conservative Party has got to realise that will be done by the public sector as well as private house, builder, house builders. And if you're going to deal with the real problems of the social elderly, that will have to be done largely by the public sector. So I believe there's a great reform needed in the Conservative Party. But really, you've got to decide this. You're the generation, if you really believe in Western liberal values, it's your generation who will have to fight to defend them. And it'll be a hard and difficult fight, and a long fight. But that fight is a hard fight. It is something that your generation will have to do, not mine. But believe, be optimistic about it. Go into the fight willing to fight, because it's something worth fighting for. Our country is a marvellous country. Millions of people want to live in it. It has wonderful advantages. In no British streets have, have actually smelt tear gas. No British streets have seen people hosed down by water cannon. British streets have not seen people covering for rubber bullets. We have lots of advantages in our country, but they have to be fought for and will only come through a political, political recovery and parliamentary sovereignty.